Um, we're treating this as kind of an introduction to post processing in Shogun Post. So what we want to do is give a bit of context so folks who aren't perhaps familiar with motion capture and what these processes involve can have a sense of why we do these things, why we build these tool sets. So if you're unfamiliar with mocap or visual effects, there's often this sense of you just do things, you, you will capture motion and then suddenly you have an amazing game and this game might, these games might be FPS's, they might be role-playing games, they might all, all these different things. And likewise, we tend to think that, well, we just capture data and then we have amazing shows. There's this kind of myth that we just have this magical technology which captures data and before you know it, we have the best products on planet Earth. So this tends to be the kind of perception that a lot of people have. But what this does is really miss a key point that comes in the middle, which is when we take that data, we then need to post-process it. We need to do things to get it perfect for the use in these final applications. And we do that using Shogun Post. So Shogun comprises two packages. We have Live, which focuses on our real time, on data capture and all these sorts of things, retargeting, streaming out to game engines. And then Post is our tool set for, as you might expect, post-processing. This might involve setting up uh, retargets, such as these. But other things that Post is used for includes data cleanup. So once you've captured your data, you want to take a few measures to make sure that it is looking as good as it possibly can be. So before we get into that, just grab post. So even if you haven't used post or you haven't done much motion capture yourself, if you've used Autodesk products such as Maya and Max or you've used Unreal Engine or Unity, you will feel right at home using this because a lot of the same conventions exist. You have your viewport, you have your standard uh, interactions and you have your main menu from which you can select all your different options. So what we are going to do is we are going to grab a demo file that we captured earlier using Shogun Live. Now the biggest test of any product manager is how quickly he can navigate folders in Windows. There we go. So we're just going to go straight through all this, grab our workshop demo and we're going to go with an MCP that we captured earlier. That'll take a couple of minutes to load. And this, is, this isn't necessarily indicative of what you may have from a shoot. So what we're doing with this is we've just grabbed a file that has lots of different data to kind of demonstrate the fundamental materials that will come in. So what we have here is we have the cameras and the layout from the actual shoot itself. We have our marker data, which at this point is yet to be assigned to our solve. And we have our solving skeleton and our skeletal mesh. What we also have along the bottom is our timeline. And because we are using motion capture data, we're not focusing on one single frame. We want the ability to quickly be able to scrub up and down and view the different frames uh, that we've captured in this take. So we can use this with the mouse wheel or we can use this by scrolling up and down on the timeline itself. Now we're all familiar with 3D views, but we have some other views that you may be familiar with as well. So if we come up to the hierarchy, anyone who's used uh, say, say Maya, for example, or any node-based software will be familiar with this kind of layout where every single property that exists in the scene, we also have a log for in our hierarchy. So if we want to go through and just delete things really quickly, or we want to double check that a piece of data exists, we can load up this panel and we'll find it all right here. What we also have, which is pretty cool, is our camera view. So if we want to get a sense of what the actual motion capture take looked like, we can use this. We get to recreate every single angle from the data that was captured from. And this can be useful in, say, just reviewing the data you captured. It can all be useful, also be useful in getting a sense of how do we actually want to optimize the layout of a particular volume. And again, we can drag along the timeline, we can play that back, and we can view it from all these individual angles and get a sense of how we might want to improve our volume on future shoots. So what we're going to go to from here, we'll say, OK, we're happy with our data. We've got what we want to work with. Let's go back to the 3D scene. And we'll then say we want to do some processing. So your data will come out of live. You can either work with it as it is and do manual tweaks or corrections or automated tests on top of that. But what you might also wish to do is just reconstruct the data from scratch. For example, you may have issues on set. You may have issues capturing data. And you want to go back to that original data to recreate the markers that you're going to work from. So I'm not going to do every single section here because it may take time, but we'll just cut through some of the, the fundamentals. We have individual operations that we can run. So if we just wanted to reconstruct the data or we just wanted to use to do like a labeling pass or reassign the marker data to a solve skeleton, we can do those as individual operations. 
but as what tends to happen is we'll end up with lots of takes that we all don't want to do in one go so we can just line up those operations and say you know what i want to reconstruct i want to label maybe i don't want to fix occlusion for whatever reason perhaps we want to come back and do that um, manually but we can do all of that here so we'll select which processes we want to run with run checked operations and then all the, the settings that we've put down here will be run through sequentially and we'll get a nice new data set as a result of that what i'm going to do is the old adage of here's one i made earlier excuse me this is where we hope that we've opened the right file a bit of artificial tension to end the day can go a long way from a narrative perspective if we bring up the 3d scene cool so we're going to check out this chat Cool. so this is perhaps a bit more indicative of what you might get having done a mocap shoot where all of your labels have been marked we have a labeling skeleton and we can start taking a look at our data along here so before we go too far into that let's take a let's take a look at some of the options we have to try and optimize the actual data cleanup process so one thing for example we're not using our solving skeleton or skin we're not using our cameras we don't want the risk of perhaps touching these or interacting with these as a result of our um, manual cleanup process. So what we can do is come up to view filters and simply say, I don't want to see cameras. I don't want to see unlabel markers. I also don't want to see the solve. So we're going to load up our labeling skeleton. Small things, but they go a long way because when you're doing lots of manual tweaks, you want your operations to be as streamlined and efficient as possible. No one likes fighting viewports. I've worked in tech uh, long enough myself to know whatever package I'm using, I want my experience to not be headache inducing. I want as few barriers between me and the goals of my process as I can possibly get to. Now with that in mind, there's another few things that we've done as well. So if we play along the timeline, this is great for getting kind of an overview of what the data is doing, but it might be that I want to interact with a certain piece of data. I want to get a sense of what one very particular marker is doing. So if we use the sternum as a example, Sure, I can click and drag and move around to try and get the right vantage point, but what I can also do is hit F. F will snap us straight to that uh, marker, and then we can drag along and view it far more closely. Now, what we also might do is we might be actually quite happy with how far out we've viewed, maybe want a bit more context of the data we're working in. So we don't want to zoom in. What we want to do is just hit C. Probably not the best example. Let's check a different one. If we hit C, then that will snap the pan into position without changing the zoom. And it's useful just having these techniques. So as you're on the fly checking different markers, you're not having to constantly zoom in, pan the camera, zoom out to find the perfect location. A drawback of this, or at least with this approach, is sure, we might have a marker selected that we want to work with, but as it moves, who'd have thought that motion capture data involves movement? Things move around the scene and we don't want to necessarily lose that as part of the take that we're doing. So what we may also do is hit C, and then X, we are now going to lock to that. So when we play the data back, the screen is attached to that marker. So we can continue to rotate around it. If we go with something like, let's try one of the fingers, something a bit more interactive and scary looking. Let's lock into that. And now what we can see is the camera is going to stay with that marker um, being sent for the position. So the camera will move around the data. We don't have to keep changing its position manually. Another important thing to do that I totally forgot to do yesterday was when we're done with that, we actually want to turn it off because if we don't, then we're going to be locked in and that's going to uh, affect our ability to pan around. So if we move that here and we can kind of go back to normal. So another thing we can do is what we'll often find is when we're reviewing data, we want to get really fine tuned. We want to have we don't want to be constantly trying to grab the timeline to find the perfect position we want to work with. So if we just move along and say, take a look at up here, we might be interested in just a couple of frames. Let's just say we're interested in what the fingers are doing. So we can zoom in, wrong button. Let's grab this guy. I'm going to zoom into here. So, okay, we want to watch what this particular marker is doing. Rather than go through the entire timeline, um, from scratch, we can hold down S and we will start to move through uh, the actual frame rate. Or we can just click it one by one. So if we want to work on a per frame basis, this gives us the, the ability to do so. We're not constantly jumping around the timeline trying to find the perfect bit that we wish to work with. So one thing that we always kind of emphasize is let's say, okay, we're familiar, use, we are comfortable using the viewport. We're kind of happy knowing which part of the data we want to work with. Now we want to actually get a sense of where the problems are. And sure, now one thing we can do is just sit back and kind of eyeball it. And the more experience we get, the more time we spend doing motion capture, the more comfortable we get kind of making those calls. But when we're first coming into it, we want as much kind of objective um, 
data to inform what we need to clean up. So what we're going to do is get rid of processing because that guy's sorted. We'll bring down a second window and on this one we are going to change our 3D scene to data health. Now what this is doing is giving us every single marker that is in this in this take and it's giving us a sense of how good the data is. So if we look around on say, I just seem to be a fan of the sternum today so we're going to focus on that one. We can see that we have a couple of gaps right here and likewise if we come over and check out our skeleton we should see that the sternum appears here. So as we can see, because we have this solid block of color, we know, okay, we have that piece of data, and as indeed, it's there. But then as soon as we go into the gap, it's disappeared. So we know that we have a missing marker. Now this might have resulted from a couple of different things, but what we can have confidence in is this was probably a question of occlusion. If we look at the take, we'll see that earlier on, the hands are further out, so it's more than likely that this marker could be seen by multiple cameras all at once. But as the hands come in, naturally they start to occlude that part of the, the body. And as a result, it was most likely that the cameras just were not able to see this anymore. So we have confidence that this is something that's become as a result of an occlusion. So what we can do, if we bring up our graph, what the graph gives us is the axis, the, excuse me, the motion across each axis as we go along uh, the timeline. So if we click and drag along this, we get a sense of how this marker is actually moving um, across each axis. So if we pull out, ideally what we want are nice smooth lines like the ones we have here. So if you look at the viewport on the left where we see the actual motion and on the right we check the marker data, we can see a fairly healthy relationship between Sure, these curves might move up and down, but they are not moving unnaturally. They follow the natural motion of the subject that we've captured. When we get to this area, however, we have these sudden jumps, these sudden changes. Now, it's not impossible for, change, for jumps like this to happen in data, but it's incredibly unlikely. Unless you're doing a very particular motion, chances are that this is an issue. This is something that we've missed. So what we're going to do is zoom in. I am possibly the worst person to demo how to use a mouse, so please don't judge our software on my capabilities in that respect alone. But what we can do, we can come in, we can grab this particular gap, and we can see, you know what, we have, so these black marks that we see on the lines up at the top, each of those represent a frame. So we can see that we have frames along here and then we suddenly have them disappear. But what the red line is giving us is a sense of what the relationship between those frames actually is. So we can come over to this here, he says, while also forgetting how to use a mouse. If we bring up our marker, where are we, marker editing. So I'm gonna skip along, we're gonna to go to fill gaps. And just to demonstrate one of the options we have, we're going to use an interpolate. Now what interpolate does, it will take the last key in, in, on the graph, it will take the next key on the graph and basically fill in between the two. So if we get the current frame, we hit fill using interpolation, we can see that it's literally just added a frame to each one of those missing areas. If we come down and take a look at our data, although we have a marker, it's got these cylindrical elements. That's just to show us as, we're pre as we are reviewing the data, cool, these markers we got from the shoot, these are markers that we have si since fixed in post. A problem with doing this, however, is that we have filled in a gap where we know full well that there's an actual error at the start and end of that interpolation. So although that's a really cool uh, effect, excuse me, a really cool tool to just fill in the data, we don't want to just rely on that because we know that the data either side of that fill is incorrect. We would, so we have the risk where if we were to just automate this, there's a chance that the fill-in, that the interpolation we use is going to fill based on incorrect data. So what we want to do is get a more robust label set up before we actually do that. So how we're going to do this, we're going to zoom out again and get a bit more context. So we can see we have this super nice smooth line on the left, we have all this unbridled chaos and then it smooths out again. So what we want to do is take out as much of this unbridled chaos as possible and then we will rebuild based on that. So what we are going to do, we're going to do a quick drag of these markers. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to use the wrong button and then, oh, wow, thank you, Windows. That was super helpful. We're going to hold down Alt. We're going to do a select over this entire region. And the reason that I've extended the graph like this is because if we kind of zoomed in on a normal level like this, it's really hard to grab those frames. We want confidence that the frames we are grabbing are the wrong ones. So by warping the graph this way, it's way easier to select all those. If we hold down Control-Alt, we're going to cut keys and we're going to cut all keys along that selected range. 
And what we're going to see is when those keys get removed, it's going to fill in the gaps kind of automatically. So we remove those keys and you'll see the dotted line behind this, that is the rain, that is the motion that we had previously. This solid line that we had on top is, this is now the motion that we're going to be working with. We could use fill interpolation again, but what we want to do ideally is have a bit more confidence in what we are going to fix it with. So another option we have is called rigid fill. How rigid fill works is we select several markers that we know stay rigid in terms of their relationship to each other. For example, a marker on my shoulder and a marker on my hand, their relationship is not rigid. It can change throughout a motion. Whereas what we have up top from the sternum all the way up, from the clav, sorry, I didn't do too much biological science at school, so forgive me if I forget bone names, but we have these three markers here that we know have a strong rigid relationship. So we're gonna select those three, happy days. And this red marker down here, this represents the marker that's missing. So we're gonna select this one. We're gonna come over to our fill rigid, and this time we're gonna go for the, in fact, let's go for the selective ranges. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna fill in this missing data, not based on an interpolation, but based on the relationship between the missing marker and the markers we've selected, because we have that confidence that their relationship is rigid. We fill rigid, and now if we come back, we have complete keys, so they've filled in really nicely. We have confidence that these are gonna be accurate based on the other markers that we've used. And if we get rid of my excess of windows, if we play this data back now, we have a nice smooth reconstruction over the area that was previously empty. So now what we can do, because we're far happier, we have more confidence in the work that we've done here, we can now assign this over to our solve. So I'm gonna go back to our view filters, which I already had open. Let's put the solve back on. And now that we have a bit more confidence in the data that we've worked with, we can reopen the processing panel. And we're just gonna assign, we're just gonna fix the solving. So the, the point I mentioned earlier about how we have these different options, we don't want to reconstruct at this point, we don't want to label or fix occlusion because we've done it manually. So all we wanna do now is come down to sort the solving. Now, if life wanted to get really tense, the computer would crash and we'd start over from scratch. This is a live demo and it wouldn't be a true Viacom demo without something blowing up, but we've hit 60% and I am very confident we're gonna to get to 100 with no problems. He says, but they'll deserve comments. Happy days. So now what we've done, we've cleaned up our data and now we've assigned that to our solve. So if I bring back the window to here, if we click and drag over the area that we know we've fixed, we have this really smooth motion and it's also reflected on our character skin. If we go earlier, we can see the effects of where we don't do this. So if we pull along, when we do lose the marker, we also see that warping on the, on the character. And this is important because ultimately, we can edit the markers, we can, we can clean up the data, but ultimately this is going to go onto a character mesh. So the reason we encourage people to keep coming back to this view is you can get an actual realistic sense of whether this data is gonna work on the character that we are working with. On which note, this is just like I say, a quick introduction to uh, post-processing in post. These are all the kind of processes you can do manually or likewise if you want to batch them or you want to run them automated, you can do so. Thank you.